Sounds good. Yeah. Rinder, I don't know. Uh, do you know what's hot? Rivers. I've lost the back channel chat. How do I get back to that?
Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2020 plenary lecture. Thank you all for joining us today for your first class at U of T Engineering. I'd like to introduce you to Professor Jason Baslack, a heart teaching innovative professor and the Dean's advisor on indigenous initiatives to guide us through a land acknowledgement before we begin. Jason. Sorry about that. There was a delay, I guess, in my unmuting. Um, so uh, my name is Professor Jason Baslack. I wear many hats here at the university. One hat that the majority of you will get to know immediately is as coordinator and design instructor in engineering strategies and practice, APS 111, the first year design course. Another hat that I wear is tied to my background. I'm a, of Métis ancestry on my mother's side along with European descent originally uh, from Poland and Ukraine on my father's side. I mention this because my purpose here today is to start us off with a land acknowledgement. For some of you, land indigenous land acknowledgements are something you experienced daily in school growing up. However, a significant number of you, uh, this is probably the first time you've ever experienced this. In fact, many of you might not be familiar, familiar with the indigenous people of Canada at all. For this group, I want to do a little micro lesson. So uh, next slide, please. Indigenous people of Canada is an umbrella term for three groups of people who are native to Turtle Island. Turtle Island is the indigenous name for North America. The First Nations and the Inuit were the first people in North America, predating Columbus's arrival by thousands of years. The Métis people, my people, are born out of a unique culture from the union of First Nations people and the earliest European settlers. The Indigenous people of Canada include hundreds of distinct First Nations, Inuit communities, and Métis nations. Indigenous people are spread all over Canada and speak almost 100 different languages. Well, not me personally, but as a whole. We have different traditions, we have different foods, we have different spiritual rituals. Despite all of our differences, there is one common unifying link between all Indigenous people, our historic and current connection to the land. Our sacred connection to the land is what enabled us to survive, not only survive, but thrive in some of the harshest environments in the world. For the Indigenous people, the land is not a static collection of rocks, but is a living being giving life to us all. Next slide, please. It is due to this sacred belief about the land upon which we walk that the Indigenous people have a tradition of land acknowledgements. When an Indigenous visitor would visit another nation, they would start meet the meeting with a land acknowledgement. The visitor would explain where they are from and acknowledge that they are a guest on the homeland of the community being visited. When European settlers began arriving on Turtle Island, the Indigenous people tried to continue with this tradition but once the settlers began to take over, these and other traditions were banned. In recent times, Canadians, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, have returned to this tradition. I would like to share this tradition with you now. Next slide. Finally, the land acknowledgement is done specifically for the land upon which the meeting is taking place. We are, however, living in interesting times where those of you watching right now are spread across the globe. Therefore, I'm gonna give a land acknowledgement designed specifically for online meetings. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of all the lands on which we are today. While we meet today in a on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land, which we each call home. To do this, we reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Métis and First Nations people that call this nation home. Please join me 
in a moment of reflection to acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past and, con and to consider how we can, each in our own way, try to move forward in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Thank you. Uh, next slide. Now that we have done the online land acknowledgement, I'd like to share our University of Toronto St. George campus specific acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge this sacred land upon which the University of Toronto operates. It has been the site of human activity for 15,000 years. This is the land of the Huron Wendat, the Patoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. The territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on, on this territory. One interesting aspect of our traditional lands on which the university reside is this Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. This actually was an environmental treaty between multiple nations hundreds of years before Rachel Carson wrote Silent Scream and launched the Western world's drive towards environmental sustainability. Thank you for your attention. I'm not an expert in all things Indigenous, but if at any time in the future you want to chat about the Indigenous people of Canada, I'm happy to. Now I'd like to call upon Professor Coyle to continue with the presentations. Thank you. I would, uh, I'd now like to introduce our Dean, uh, Chris Yip, who began his term with the faculty in 2019 and was last year's plenary speaker. Dean Yip is a leading scholar in the field of single molecular biophysics and a faculty member with the Department of Chemical Engineering and Applied Chemistry, the Department of Biochemistry, and the Institute of Biomedical Engineering. He's also a principal investigator with the Donnelly Center for Cellular and Biomolecular Research at the University of Toronto. Dean Yip. Great, thanks Tom. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, taking the time to, to be here virtually under these uh, quite different circumstances. And I think I, I speak for everyone when I would say I wish I wish we could be together in person to enjoy the first lecture of your your program here in U of T Engineering uh, to be together in our historic Con Hall, the the background of which is behind me in my virtual background here. Uh, I know this this really isn't the way that uh, any of us were hoping to start the term. I know that uh, some of you are likely feeling a bit disappointed that you're missing out on some of the experience, but I do know that that. Uh, our engineering society has been running lots of different meetups and different events and, and trying to help build that that important community uh, for us all. Uh, but these challenges and setbacks are, are really just part of, of growth and something you're, uh, that you're going to go through as in engineering. And, and it's about how we meet these challenges uh, with creativity, ingenuity, perseverance that make us uh, successful engineers. Um, I can promise you this, that when you chose U of T Engineering, you chose well. Um, our faculty and our staff are among the, the very best in Canada, indeed in the world. Uh, you would have seen some of the recognition most recently of some of our faculty uh, by the Royal Society and other uh, honor, honorifics. Um, I know that by working with uh, many of them over, the, over so many years, they are all vested uh, in your success, in, in helping you succeed, grow and thrive, and, and you're just part of this large, uh, amazing community uh, that is school. Um, from the very onset of this pandemic, way back in March, uh, they've all been working tirelessly and incredibly hard over the summer. I'm incredibly proud of the work that everyone has been doing to, to bring us all together, to prep us for, uh, for class, but even more broadly by how the community, uh, the local engineering community, the University of Toronto community, but even our alumni have stepped forward to really address all the challenges that have been brought forward by, the, by this pandemic. They've been doing what good engineers do, 
uh, take our skills and our, our insights and our perspectives and apply them to super complex and incredibly ill-defined and constantly changing challenges. Uh, it's been inspiring to see uh, where they've been applying their skills and, and how we've been made, making such a positive impact uh, on this uh, situation. And, and you're here because uh, I know that you're ready to do exactly the same thing. Um, I sat in those exact, well, maybe not your exact chairs, uh, but I sat in those chairs in Con Hall um, a few years ago, and, and I remember feeling nervous. In fact, I, I, I won't lie, I, I feel nervous every September uh, when classes start, uh, wanting to know and making sure that the that things are going to go well for everyone. Uh, you may be wondering whether you're up for it and, and uh, ready for the next four or five years of, of engineering, uh, and you're keen to get started, and you're not sure how it's going to work out. I, let me tell you, it's going to work out well. Everything's going to be fine. Um, we all feel the same doubt. It, it just means that you're 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 pushing yourself. And this is what uh, what's exciting about the opportunities here, uh, U of T Engineering. Um, we're invested in your success. Uh, we wouldn't you wouldn't be here if we didn't know uh, and we're fully confident uh, in your ability to be successful. Uh, all your profs, all your TAs, uh, we were all students. We went through these exact same things. Uh, we know there's there are no uh, uh, bad questions. All questions are great. All questions are inspirational. All questions reflect your creativity and your interest in those topics. Uh, speak up in class, uh, in tutorial, uh, during office hours, reach out, well now online, uh, get into those discussions and, and let us know how things are going. Um, as, as as I sort of scared all the faculty and students last year by, by making the statement, um, I made it a personal pledge that uh, I want to have coffee. I want to meet every single undergraduate before you before you finish your degree here at U of T. So, so I'm keen to hear from all of you individually about uh, why you came to U of T, how things are going. Uh, so feel free to do that. And I look forward to chatting with each and every one of you. Um, if if uh, it's just some uh, housekeeping stuff, but if, you know, if, if questions come up about uh, things which are beyond a uh, particular course, reach out to the first year office. Uh, they can point you to resources and tutorials, study sections, academic counseling. They're a tremendous resource. And many of you have uh, know MZ really well and, and folks in that office, and they're terrific individuals. Uh, they're there uh, to hear, and, and they've, they've uh, got all the information, tons of resources for you. Um, if it's a physical mental wellness issue, uh, reach out to health and wellness. Uh, uh, if you're on campus or in Toronto, then the Kaufman Center, um, but also accessible online and, and by phone. So there's really no need to, to act like if we know that there are challenges and, and questions will come up. Uh, so uh, if you are if you're facing any sorts of challenges, please do reach out. It's important to address things as soon as as they come up. Um, these are all other supports, but I think it's important to remember one of the best supports you've got are the other Amazingly, have 1,300 other uh, first year students or part of the other sort of 6,000 other undergraduates that are in engineering right now. They are part of your group. They are your colleagues. Uh, they will be your friends and they will be your, uh, your school alumni going forward. Uh, you're all in this together. Everybody's gone through these different experiences. They all have great advice, great resources, and they're all out there to help you. Uh, I've had tremendous conversations with alumni going uh, back as I've met them, and and they all reflect on what a tremendous and embracing and diverse and and uh, open and resourceful community uh, we have in engineering. Uh, so please reach out to our alumni. They are there. They are willing to connect, and they are happy to connect. And so that's uh, why it really is my pleasure today to introduce one of those alumni to you, uh, our plenary speaker today, uh, Narinda Dami. Uh, one of Canada's top 40 under 40 honorees in 2019 and a leader in social finance. Uh, she's worked across sectors and silos, bringing depth, perspective and rigor uh, to her work in North America and in the Global South. And she's currently a managing partner at Marigold Capital. Um, over the past decade, Narinder has designed and scaled two social ventures. Uh, as the managing director, she built LEAP, the PICO Center for Social Impact and Innovator in, in Venture Philanthropy. And as a founding executive director, she designed and scaled Rise Asset Development. Um, her work has spanned into the Global South, where she helped grow the premier agence de microfinance across Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, and has worked with a portfolio team with Acumen in Ghana and Nigeria. And she began her, engineer, her career in engineering and in finance, so a uh, tremendous uh, background. 
Uh, she's been recognized uh, as a BMW uh, Foundation Responsible Leader, uh, a lecturer at Ryerson, and, and co-created the first course in microfinance and impact investing uh, here at U of T. So very exciting. And uh, she currently serves on the board of Acumen Canada and The Circle. Um, and served on numerous other boards and investment committees. So I'm really excited to hear uh, her presentation today and, and to welcome her uh, as our plenary speaker. So please welcome uh, Narinda Dami. Thank you, Dean, and welcome class of 2T4. It is a huge honor to be here today. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I wish this could have been in person. Uh, we are in such a unique moment in history on the backdrop of great progress, technological evolution, the lifting of billions out of poverty and the Raptors winning the NBA championships. 2020 has been a difficult year. If you can even remember this far back, we started off the year with one of, with one of the worst fires in history in Australia. Then COVID-19 followed by global calls for racial justice and the Black Lives Matter movement. Society today faces growing inequality, systemic racism, and disproportional impacts of COVID on their most vulnerable in our communities. Today, this virtual gathering is in 16 different time zones as a result of COVID. We are all adapting in our own ways within our individual circumstances. However, I believe that this is also a moment of opportunity. The year holds a unique potential to change the world. And by being in this room or this virtual room today, you are building a strong platform to explore, to create, and to lead in building the future that you want. About two decades ago, I was in your seat-ish. Um, it was 2001 and I had entered into computer engineering. I was shy. Uh, I was a child or am the child of immigrants. And as, as many of you know, and pr can probably relate to, I had a set of finite options to choose from. I could be a doctor, I could be a lawyer, an accountant, or an engineer. When I look back at my almost 40 years on this planet, I see moments that have defined who I am today. And joining engineering was one of those transformational moments. In this virtual room today, we have, um, as the Dean mentioned, about 1300 students, which is a few hundred more than my year. What I think important to note is that we had half of the number of applications when I entered. So I can confidently say that you all deserve it more or smarter and are, are very likely to succeed. We had 37, we had 27% female in my class. Today, there are 37% female within the incoming class, and that is progress. 35% were international are international today versus the less than 10% of international students when I began. You can see we are diversifying. Engineering was the right decision for me, and I appreciate it every day. It was really that start to my journey. And uh, in most rooms today, so I work in the social sector and in the leadership of the social sector, I must admit that there's not a lot of engineers. So in most rooms, I am the one or one of two engineers. And it feels really good to be in a room with so many future engineers and future doctors and lawyers and bankers and community builders. Engineers are versatile and engineering is your platform to define the career and the future that you want. You will meet some of the greatest people across the next few years. Many of my closest friends are from engineering. They have been my support system throughout the years. They are my champions, they are my connectors, and they are also, most importantly, my rational thought partners. I met the type of people that allow me to thrive in engineering smart creatives. I also began my journey in engineering as somebody who was risk averse. I had to learn to ask for what I wanted early and to make the changes needed to get me closer to what I wanted to do or in reality what I thought I wanted to do at that moment. Engineering was not a risky decision. 
I knew it would be hard and I, and I felt prepared. I had worked three jobs in my last years of high school. I was a forklift driver, a tutor, and an usher at the Brampton Battalions, an OHL team that started in the late 90s in Brampton, where I was born. During the first few months of computer engineering, I made friends with amazing individuals. Um, we also spent our Friday nights having LAN parties. I quickly realized that I wasn't passionate about computer engineering as my peers. I felt I could do well if I stayed in engineering, in computer engineering, but I never felt I could do great. I lacked that passion and spark I saw in my friends. So in my mind, in my risk averse mind, I made a big move. I moved from computer engineering to electrical engineering. And, and for anyone, um, and I believe it's the same today, but the first two years of computer and electrical engineering are the same. You know, while truly this move was really no risk, it was a foundation for me to challenge my personal idea that I needed to map my future and stick to that plan to be successful. And anything outside of that was failure. Early in my first year, as a Edward S. Rogers Senior Scholar, I was invited alongside about 15 or 20 engineering students to a reception with the Rogers family and a few executives from Rogers. Partway through the evening, surprise to myself, I walked up to the Vice President of Engineering and I shared, among other things, that I was really eager to work at Rogers that summer. He placed my resume on top of the co-op pile alongside Waterloo students, and at the time we did not have a summer co-op program at U of T, and, and then I secured my first engineering job at Rogers, testing video on demand in 2002. I learned, and I learned that if I wanted something, I needed to ask for it. I later realized in the coming year that engineering while making me a better thinker and a problem solver, solver was likely not the career I would stay in. In my third year of engineering, I was accepted into the Jeffrey School program. It's a seven year program that allowed me to, to leverage what I was learning in engineering and expand my skill set through a full time MBA at the Rotman School of Management. And so in seven years, I completed my MBA, my bachelor's in electrical engineering, in addition to two years of work. I was busy. And then as I entered my MBA, I was 24 at the time, it was, it was really clear to me, crystal clear, that I was going to be an investment banker or a management consultant. That's what everyone wanted. So I secured a coveted summer placement in an investment bank in the summer. I quickly realized that I did not want to work in investment banking. So I scheduled some time with a career coach at Rotman. I shared that I was really passionate about social impact. I had been active with student groups and initiatives across my education that were surrounded uh, about social impact. I was also inspired by Muhammad Yunus, who, would who was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2006. He had helped to bring microfinance to scale. And that is what I wanted to do. I wanted to combine my passion for social impact with business. Eunice, through expanding the reach of microfinance and spreading the gospel of a double bottom line, was able to share to the world that you could both do good and do well. You could meet, merge meaning with money. And through the growth of microfinance, which is access to capital to those who are underbanked or unbanked, billions have been catalyzed um, and enabled to access this capital um, across the world. For me, this goes down as likely the worst advice I'd received. A career coach um, told me as I shared kind of my reason and what I was passionate about, she recommended that I focus on building a real career and join a few boards, volunteer to fulfill that social impact need that I had. Um, I've had some great advice. This was not that. Um, so I decided to move to West Africa to work in microfinance. It was my boldest move to date. Moving from a potential career in investment banking, which was safe, 
which was lucrative, to microfinance in Burkina Faso, Mali, and Cote d'Ivoire. I had truly started to embrace risk. I lived in Ouagadougou for a few years. At the microfinance organization, I supported the finance team and led the management information system migration, working on the build and the integration with a team in Pakistan. I was 26 when I started. I grew, I learned. I learned that doing good goes beyond good intentions. Programs like Voluntourism, Think We Charity, or Tom Shoes uh, can hurt local economies. I learned that to be effective in social impact work, we need to build with communities and not for communities. I also learned how to drive a manual car on the streets of Ouagadougou, which was its experience in itself, and discovered the power of bar soap to solve for an overheating car. I came back to Canada and really quickly, and this was the day after I returned from Burkina, I was introduced to Joe and Sandy Rotman. They were looking to build a micro fund and they had bold ideas of how we could enable people with a history of mental health and addiction challenges to, to secure employment. So at the age of 28, I became the founding executive director of Rise Asset Development, a microfinance, a micro fund for people with a history of mental health and addiction challenges. We all know that employment is a social determinant of health and a predictor of recovery. I was building a pathway to employment for those who were left out. And I continue to learn and grow within this journey. In building, I learned never to take no or take not now personally. At some point through this journey, I convinced U of T Commerce to allow me to build and teach a course in impact investing and brought on board a colleague within the sector. So the course was around impact investing and microfinance. While I had six years under my belt in microfinance, I knew the theory of impact investing, but didn't have that practical experience. So I left Rise and I moved back to West Africa and worked um, for Acumen Fund. I wanted that practical impact, that investing portfolio experience, and Acumen was a leader in impact investing. They're a global nonprofit changing the way the world tackles poverty by investing in sustainable businesses, leaders, and idea. Coming back to Canada, and for the next six years, I embraced my next journey to build. I built LEAP, the PICO Center for Social Impact. I moved into BCG, the Boston Consulting Group, the incubated and housed us. And I started to work with CEOs of the private sector to build and to execute on a model of venture philanthropy in Canada that helped to select, support, and scale what works. I was surrounded around smart, motivated individuals, and I evolved as a leader. What I learned in a decade of leading and building social ventures, I could not replicate without actually doing the building. I learned what I believed would have taken me decades had I gone the traditional route. Entrepreneurship has that power, but it also comes with risk. My annual income significantly varied. I took on many contracts and I renewed many contracts. I shared some bad advice before, but I also want to share some of them, some great advice I've received. Early in my career, a mentor, a mentor recommended that I define my motto. While it could be difficult to know exactly where you want to go, by defining your deepest values and goals, you can be enabled at each personal and professional pivot point in your life to make the right decisions for you. For me, my motto is increasing access to opportunity. My parents, immigrants, work long hours, many jobs to provide my siblings and I access to quality public education and employment opportunities. They moved to Canada from India in the 70s. My motto is personal and it's achievable. Today, I continue to follow this across my life. I am the philanthropy lead for Okta in addition to the Marigold Capital, and Okta might be a familiar company for those in the room. It is a publicly traded identity and access management company based in San Francisco. 
It provides cloud software that helps companies manage and secure user authentication into modern applications and for developers to build identity controls into applications, websites, web services, and devices. Our impact work at Okta, Okta for Good, mission is an extension of Okta to strengthen the connections between people, technology, and community. We invest in enabling the social sector to be powerful as their missions through technology. I am also, I am also the managing partner of Miracle Capital. We are an impact investment fund. We invest in entrepreneurs, companies, and communities that are overlooked and undervalued. We apply a gender and social equity lens to our investments and work across Canada and the United States. Being activated as part of my community has always been part of my DNA, and I encourage you, if it isn't already, to embrace the community in your community. Today, I sit on a few boards and, and have supported a number of organizations. I have met some of the most amazing individuals through these experiences, both while I was at school and post-school. As I reflect on, on my career, I have to say that each pivot in, in my career has been intentional. I've never compromised on my vision of impact, my integrity, and my respect for myself. And that's been hard. I've shed tears, but it's also the reason why I'm here today. My foundation for this journey was engineering, and I believe that the next four years will be instrumental in your lives and will be the foundation of something great. Engineering also sparked the evolution of how I thought about social impact, which was not something I thought it would do. Um, a number of professors significantly impacted my time in engineering. One was a professor who taught a course as part of the Certificate in Preventative Engineering and Social Development. He taught me about the concept of no harm and unintentional consequences of our work as engineers. He taught me to be smarter on how I thought about impact, to always look deeper, to question. In the social sector, we often forget about the no harm principle. You know, we are good people doing good work. Yeah, there is this really interesting binary mindset because you know we're either good people or we're bad people and that this has such limitations. When we think of doing good as binary or really anything as binary, it's difficult to take criticism or feedback and it's difficult to grow. Dolly Chu, who is a social scientist who studies psychology of good people, um, is a professor at the New York University of Stern School of Business. She notes that our attachment to being good people is getting in the way of being better people. She encourages us to be good-ish. One professor that I spoke of earlier, in particular during my time in engineering, helped me realize that we need to look beyond the binary, to look beyond the surface. And for the last 12 years, I have been doing what I am passionate about with a mindset of being goodish and a mindset of growth. Work has never been a nine to five for me, and I imagine for many of you, I won't as well. I found what I was passionate about and I followed. Engineering taught me how to learn and how to fail. It has allowed me to envision the world I wanted and go out and build it. And I believe it'll do the same for you. As you move through the next few years, I encourage you to build your community. Hold on to that community, to be curious, to ask questions, to work hard. And I would say you need to work hard in engineering. In the second year of engineering, I, work, I, I lived with a bunch of high school friends and um, other courses in the University of Toronto have a different type of workload. So be prepared, work hard, and I think you will do great. Follow your passion. I did, and it's been the best move I've ever made. And be bold. To everyone in this room, this virtual room, you have the opportunity to shape your future, shape your purpose, and shape your impact. 
in this extremely unique moment of society, you can build the world that you want. I wish you the very best in your journey with such a strong foundation that you've chosen in engineering. Thank you. Thank you so much, Narinder. Those were amazing, inspirational words for all of us to consider in the years to come. Uh, we have time for some questions from the audience. Uh, so this is your opportunity to ask Narinda directly. Uh, you can use the Q&A feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, are there any questions to start? Uh, here's one from uh, from one of our audience members. Uh, what are some of your best leadership strategies? Uh, a great question. Um, to to get out of the way, I think is a, a a big part of my leadership style. Hire great people and then allow them to make decisions to thrive and to have that independence and autonomy. I've always found that. Um, in giving more control and more ownership of work or of, of areas of, of your organization to individuals, you see the best come out of, of individuals. Um, I also would add that uh, fire quickly. So, uh, you know, we all make bad hires and, and sometimes you need to be able to recognize that quickly and, and ensure that you're bringing on the right people into your team. OK, thank you. Uh, here's another. Uh, even though you were following your passion, did you ever doubt yourself? And how did you overcome that? Uh, great question. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I doubt myself and I have continued to doubt myself in various aspects, but it was very focused on what was the impact I wanted to create and my ability to drive what I wanted to drive. And I think that comes with being an engineer. I think the foundation of what we learn, um, the rigor in which we work, really provided me with that confidence I needed when I had those doubts come up across my career to be able to put it into perspective. Um, there's also, in, in meditation, there's a concept called equanimity. Essentially, things come and go and the attention you place on it is really going to be what it is. And so I realized that I had the intentional, it was my choice, what attention I wanted to put on any doubt, on any concern. And, and throughout the years, I've become better and better to, to diminish kind of that doubt. And if I'm, if I'm doing something that's based on data, based on fact, based on something I believe, I commit wholeheartedly to it. OK, I have a couple questions I'm going to combine here. Um, how has being a woman in engineering and finance impacted your career and the way you view it? Uh, and, and maybe as part of that, what does a typical day look like? Um, so so being a woman, you know, I, when I entered engineering uh, in computer and electrical, I think the, the, the broader percentage is 27%. Uh, I do believe it was lower in computer and electrical engineering, so there were not a lot of women. Um, you know, I that is that has always been something I've embraced. It's never bothered me. Um, you are definitely I've, I've become accustomed being the only X in the room. So you know, the only woman in the room, the only woman of color in the room, the only engineer in the room. Um, and, at, you know, at times that can be intimidating or that can pose some challenges. But the more I built my own confidence 
and, and a belief in, in my work, um, what I envisioned, the easier that became. Um, so I'm a woman, I'm a woman of color, I am short, you cannot tell, but all of this um, you know, feeds into the image I put out to the world. And some people receive that image and they have some stereotypes. And that is their journey and they can enjoy that journey. And I've learned how to not allow that to affect me. That said, when you're in meetings, you know, you make your space. You know, you ensure that you're hurt. You, you learn these tricks and tips along the way to really have the ability to command a room, um, to command a team, and then to get um, to influence what you're trying to influence. Um, so finance was interesting because in investment banking, I would say the culture is not very conducive to women. And I know a number of you will go into investment banking and you know there's a lot of value in that. Um, but one of the reasons I've left investment banking or in, and chose not to stay in it is because I wanted to ensure if I was spending so much time in my career, I was within a culture that I could thrive in. Um, and again, investment banking continues to evolve and I think they're working on how to make it a, a more um, effective space for all genders. Um, but that was um, for me also just a reason why I didn't stay in an organization and in a career. And I think there might have been a part two to that. Uh, it was just, I think you've covered a bit of it. What What's a typical day like for you? So, so it's interesting right now. I am both the philanthropy lead um, of a San Francisco uh, tech company and also a managing partner at an impact investment fund. So, so my day is very, <laughs> lots of meetings, lots of connections um, with individuals. Um, it, it varies from connecting to, to stakeholders, to reading uh, investment memos, creating investment memos, um, uh, trying to dig deeper into what is happening in a specific industry or in a uh, on a specific issue. Um, and, and that is actually what I love is that I cannot tell you what a typical day looks like because each day is so different uh, and it keeps me on my toes. I, um, I think when I found that my days were predictable is when I decided to, to also leave organizations and move into the next part of my career journey. Great, thank you. Uh, again, I'm gonna. We have lots and lots of questions, so I'm gonna try and combine uh, two or three. There were a number of questions about uh, if you were to look back, uh, is there anything you would do different? For example, would you have focused earlier in your um, education on the financial side of things? Um, and similar question: How does how did you find the MBA? Uh, working together with your engineering degree, uh, complementary or competitive? So, so I'll answer the, the first, the second part of that question first. Um, after engineering, I feel like you are equipped to tackle anything in the world. And so I found actually MBA much lighter in terms of workload and intellectual um, ability you needed to execute. So so the, the great thing about engineering is it sets you up for such a phenomenal uh, career and um, you're ready in, in all these various situations. And I found an MBA, it was um, engineering set me up for success. Yeah, it definitely complements engineering. It's, it, you know, you learn those softer skills and I'm sure you've heard this before, but you learn, you know, how to engage, how to present, how to network, a bit more on finance, um, fundamental aspects of, I think, your life that will help you succeed. Being smart is great, and all of you are smart. Complementing that with the social acumen will take you far, and that's what the MBA provided for me. Um, and I wouldn't, so I went in a, in a different route. I did the combined program, for me, I wouldn't change that. So I have no regrets in, in, in engaging in that seven year program. You know, for some, they may have preferred, they may, they may prefer to work before they go back to their, um, their MBA. I did find that with engineering as a base, I was more equipped than some of my friends who had finance as a base. 
Um, I am biased, um, but, but I, 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 I think that you've made such a great choice of being in engineering today. Okay, here's the question with the most thumbs, thumbs up. Um, what do you think helped you break out of your personal bubble and start being the leader you knew you could be? Uh, personally, I feel I would love to apply my leadership skills, but struggle getting around my shyness. Yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, it's taking that first step was really important. I, I am sure that conversation I had with that VP in engineering was probably the most awkward conversation I've had, um, but it didn't matter. I was putting myself out there. And then throughout my journey, I kept doing that. I kept going to networking events and it wasn't, I think networking sometimes gets a bad name. And, and if you do it for the wrong reasons, maybe it is, it deserves that name. But I think networking and connecting with people can be so much more. Um, what's really helped me get out of my shell was curiosity. Whoever I meet with, whether it is a CEO, um, an investor, a grantee, a community leader, you know, our, my concierge, you know, I approach every conversation with the same mindset. I'm going to learn something new and and there is going to be value that I receive from that conversation. And that that kind of just general curiosity has allowed me to make so many different relationships across my journey and also just allowed me to then kind of break this shell of shyness that I had at the beginning. Um, I also learned that it doesn't matter if people say no. It doesn't matter if people don't reply to your email. It doesn't matter if you get rejected. Um, and so putting more weight on the doing of like that reach out and less weight on the outcome of that specific reach out helped me become more comfortable and confident in, in, um, in myself across that journey. Okay, thank you again. Um... Uh, there's one question I need to scroll up to find it, um, and one that uh, you've you've addressed uh, a, a bit in previous questions. But how has being an, a woman in engineering and finance uh, impacted your career and the way you view it? So, I it's interesting. Um, there's a piece of gender of being a woman, and then there's a piece of being a woman of color. Um, and and those, are, those are two different journeys. Um, as a woman, things have been a bit more difficult. Um, you know, I don't always get the same, you know, I will say a statement. People may be shocked with the confidence in which I say that statement, and that happens today as well. Um, but that happened earlier on in my career. Um, there's, you know, there's at least uh, there's this mindset of, you know, being treated as an equal, you need to be better. And so, and, and we've all heard about the glass ceiling, right? The, the glass ceiling that exists for women and that exists in, in engineering and that exists in finance and the data shows that it exists and it's perhaps slightly moving toward um, toward a bit of change, but in general, we're, we're, we have not been very successful in breaking that glass ceiling. So as a woman, you face these multiple barriers. Um, what I would say is across my journey, I've had some phenomenal female and male mentors who've helped me navigate those conversations, navigate and help me uh, improve my presence, improve the way I communicate. And I'm, a, I'm absolutely grateful for their advice in making me a better leader and making me um, able to manage often some barriers that are opposed because I'm a woman. Now, as a woman of color, that that ceiling is, is not glass, it's concrete. And so you, you are in this mindset of, OK, now I need to be even better at, to be treated as an equal. And, and it's not the healthiest mindset, to be honest. Um, but it's a mindset that I had and that allowed me to work really, really hard to achieve what I did and that 
you know, that achievement, I can account to myself and my hard work and no other, no other factor there. Um, so I would say that, you know, it's, there is, um, there is definitely challenges. Um, there is an evolving sector of engineering and finance who's recognizing these barriers that are in place for women and for women of color. And they're working proactively to remove those, to create mentorship opportunities with leaders, to ensure that there is a democratization of access. Um, and I think through that removal, we're going to see huge advancements on um, on the growth and kind of leadership opportunities for women and women of color. Great, thank you. Uh, perhaps one last question. Uh, do you have a favorite memory from your time in first year? Hmm. That, that is a great question. Um, so I lived at Innes College for, for some of you who may be living there. And um, so there, there was, and, and I was able to connect with a whole, you know, just form a really great group of friends. Um, Suds, I don't know if, I'll just share a few thoughts. So Suds is, is the cafeteria um, in the engineering and it was a meeting place. I, I remember after class, before class, you know, in between class, my friends and I would connect there. We would eat there, we'd laugh there, we'd have beer there after after school when it was allowed. Um, but that was such a such a phenomenal space of connection, and I have such great memories from there. Um, and also, I, I would say, I, I, I actually really enjoy and remember the awkwardness of what I was and who I was at that time. So I, the, the funny thing is, is I lived at Innes, and so it was a 10 minute walk to engineering. But because I was so eager, I'd put all of my textbooks in my backpack. And so I'd walk with almost a little hunch. And then every every course I would sit there with, you know, my calculus and, you know, all the other textbooks. Um, I would barely look at them throughout the day, but it was just little moments like that of humor and being able to kind of laugh at myself today and um, this bring me a lot of joy. OK, thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I've, I've skipped over some some comments and questions. There were many uh, of of the nature of, of this one that I'll read. Um, I really appreciate having a woman of color to look up to look up to from our university. And there were a number of comments. Uh, great, great talk, very powerful. Uh, and so uh, thank you very much. Uh, for for your time. Thank you. Thank you. It, I just want to leave with one word is or one statement is this is, you know, your your journey to create and engineering is such a powerful foundation and I wish everyone the best. Uh, we asked Narinder to share an organization where we could donate uh, in order to express our appreciation for the time and effort she's put into uh, preparing and presenting her talk today. Uh, she's chosen the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada, the Circle, um, which is uh, one of the organizations where Narinder plays uh, a leadership role uh, serving on the board of directors of the Circle. So once again, thank you, Narinder, for, for sharing your time with us today. Uh, and to everyone else, uh, enjoy your first day of class, and we'll see you around school. <laughs>